I said we'd, uh, we could continue right where we left off, but let's make sure we all remember where that is and what we were doing. So in class yesterday, we introduced what I called the, the method of calculus. You want to know some information, you approximate the information, and then you make your approximations better and better somehow until they stop becoming approximations and become exact. And we were still at the making approximation stage of things. We were looking at a function. I can't remember the details, but it would have looked something like this. And we said this function is a position function. It's here x is the time in seconds since a projectile is launched. Launched is launched, and we're using function notation, so this x is the input, and then the output is the height. And again, I don't know if, um, if it's likely that people remember sort of equations like this, it's likely that at some point in like a physics classroom or something, you learned equations like this. Um, in physics, you just tend to, in, at least in high school physics, you tend to just be told the equation is true. And after this, towards the end of class, we're actually going uh, towards the end of the semester. We're actually going to learn where equations like this come from and why there's a negative 4.9 and answer questions like that. So something to look forward to, but for now, let's just accept that this is the equation that we have. And we ask a question. How fast is the projectile moving after one second. And well, we, we don't have a velocity function written on the board. If we had a velocity function like we do in, again, high school physics, we could just take the one and plug it in there. But since we don't, we need to try to figure out something else. And um, the observation I was making as class ended yesterday was, well, if we have a position function, there's something we can do that's related to the velocity. We don't have a velocity function that we can just plug um, the one in the two. But we can find 
have friends. Velocity is on intervals. Am I using F for my function? Yes. If we've got an interval, A comma B, that is a time interval. So like between zero and one seconds or between one and two seconds, some interval like that. The average velocity is given by this formula. And we spent some time trying to make sure we're all on the same page about where that formula comes from. It's just, you know, how much does the position change divided by the amount of time it takes the position to change. So let's give this some thought. How could we use average velocities to approximate the velocity at one? Um, finding the equation of the velocity is our end goal. It's something we'd like to be able to do but we can't at the moment. So a good thought, but it's not the thing we can do first. So let's say you're, you know, you're driving down a road. You're driving down a highway, and um, maybe you're a non-American and you um, don't know offhand sort of America's traffic laws or speed limits or whatever. So you don't know um, what like a normal speed would be, but but you're told that during the third and the fourth hour, your average velocity, your average speed was 65 miles per hour. If that's the only piece of information you know, and then I ask you to guess what your speed is precisely at the third hour, what would a, a reasonable guess be? Like if our average velocity is 65 miles per hour, are we spending a lot of time going at 200 miles or are we spending a lot of time going at five miles? I mean, our intuition of how averages work is that if our average velocity is around 65, our what we call instantaneous velocity, our velocity at any specific moment might also be around 65. And that's the intuition we're going to grab onto and try to use it to approximate the velocity after one second. Because remember that that's our goal. That's how calculus works. First, the approximation, then the making the approximation better. So, for example, we could find the average velocity between the first and the second. Second, 
second being used in multiple ways here. Um, so we only actually care about this one. That's the velocity we want, but we don't know how to find it. So instead we can say, well, we can take an average velocity on this little interval. And presumably the average velocity we find on the interval will be at least related to, at least sort of close to the velocity we're looking for. Like if, what's, what's a realistic number here? If we find that our average velocity is 25 meters per second, then we probably weren't moving at 500 meters per second at one. So we can get some information this way. And it's... unfortunately going to be some rather tedious messing around on the calculator just because typing everything into the calculator uh, takes like five more minutes on this whiteboard it seems like than by hand but let me uh, let me remind myself of a few things put a few things on the whiteboard, so I'm not constantly forgetting what function I'm dealing with. Uh, we'll see if the calculator behaves. The last time I tried to use it, I was getting like these four second input delays, that's impossible. If it happens again, we'll figure out something else. But since we're, we're paying for this software, we'll give it a chance to be uh, useful. We're not gonna be able to see anything. Okay, not a great sign, but um, so f of two, the formula we want is f of two minus f of one divided by two minus one. Okay, so whatever that was has seemingly fixed itself move this is right in the way of the negative sign. So f of two is negative, mm, sort of fixed itself, negative 4.9 times two squared plus 30 times two plus one minus f of one, negative 4.9, I'm writing everything. I obviously do understand that one squared is just one, and a lot of this I could do in my head, but plus 30 times one plus one, just getting, uh, bit of practice evaluating functions at numbers and remembering how that works. So there's f of two. Here's f of one. It doesn't matter because everything's positive, but properly speaking, let's see. That parenthesis should be there. So there's f of two minus f of one divided by two 
two minus one, and we get 15.3. 15.3 meters per second, because, okay, and now the cursor is frozen. All right, give me a second. Meters per second, because, F of A and F of B are outputs, and outputs here are heights. Outputs are measured in meters. B and A are inputs. Inputs are times. Times are measured in seconds. So we do get meters per second. And 15.3 that was. So this is not the velocity we're looking for. This is an average velocity on an interval. The velocity we're looking for is just the velocity at the beginning of the interval, the velocity at one. Uh, if you do remember your high school physics, um, this was launched with a uh, velocity of 30 meters per second. So it slowed down to about half its launch velocity over this interval. So this is an approximation. It might be a good one. It might be a bad one. I do not know off the top of my head what the answer we're scrambling for is. But how could we make this approximation better? So let's think this through. We're interested in the one. We're interested at the beginning of the interval. So if we are only interested in what happens near one, then we're not, you know, interested in what happens near two. The two is kind of far away from the value we actually care about. So how could we make this approximation better? You can change two to a closer number. Thank you. That's exactly correct. Um, our velocity changes over this interval. And it's only at the very beginning of the interval that the velocity is what we're interested in. So the fact that the velocity changes over the interval is bad. That's what keeps this approximation from being what we want it to be. So if we made this interval smaller, if we looked at an interval like that, for example, there would be less time to change over that smaller interval. The numbers we're looking at are all closer to the number we actually care about. And it makes sense to think that the average velocity on this interval will be closer to the exact velocity we're interested in. Not that. Let's go back here and try to make this less tedious than uh, it would otherwise be by using the um, 
the entry function to call this back up instead of re-entering the whole thing. And now, instead of two, we want f of 1.1. Uh, that is an 11, which is not what we want. So there's f of 1.1 .1 minus f of 1 divided by one point one minus one and we get a larger number. We get nineteen point seventy one. Right. And that's why instead of in spite of the awful heat, other people are keeping the window closed, um, 19.71. So we end up with a larger number than we ended up with when we were looking at the bigger interval, and that makes sense if you think about the physics, because as this projectile passes through the air, air resistance is slowing it down. So its average velocity on this big interval is smaller than its average velocity on this small interval. That makes sense. I, I, it's always a risk for or a professor to say that makes sense, I guess. Um, when you, when if you ever like read academic math journals, you'll see it is obvious thrown around a lot, and it's very rarely as obvious as the author thinks. So I guess I don't know if that makes sense. Does this? Do people like this? Does the intuition behind it clear? Well, I'm seeing some nodding, some silence. Now, if the intuition behind this is clear, it should be easy to answer the next question. If we want our approximation to be even better, how can we make our approximation even better? That is exactly correct. Thank you. To make, so we started with this large interval. To make the approximation better, we shrunk the interval down, but there's nothing magical about 1.1. If we wanted to make the interval even smaller, We could do that. And what I'm going to um, use a feature of our calculator at this point. I'm going to use the table feature. Um, just because going into that screen and manually changing all of those numbers is going to become tedious if I have to do it a lot. So I want to ch keep changing the endpoint. 
as this endpoint gets smaller and smaller, our approximation becomes better and better. So maybe I want to look at like 10 different values and see what happens as those values get smaller and smaller. Well, doing that by hand would be extremely tedious. So I think, well, I'm changing the endpoint. So the endpoint's basically a variable. Whereas the first point isn't. One is the number I'm interested in. I'm not changing one. I want one to stay put. So let's find the average value. on an interval from a one to X. Um, my notation is a little sloppy here because we've already, you know, properly speaking, used X for something else. X shows up in the function F of X, but our calculator won't let us have more than one variable, and I'm trying to make what I have written on the whiteboard match what you're going to see on the calculator. So I said, you know, what I have here is precisely what I, where I sort of don't want to be. If I have to like copy, um, do this, 10 times, let's say, with 10 different values, it's going to become very annoying very quickly. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to y equals. So we're used to using this for graphing. I'm not going to create a graph, though. I'm going to create the tape. f of one, and now, well, negative 4.9 times one squared is negative 4.9. 30 times one is 30. So there's f of one minus. Negative 4.9. Or the breaking news is never cheerful. Negative 4.9 x squared plus 30x plus 1 divided by x minus 1. And again, the reason I'm doing this is that this is going to let us just keep changing this right-hand value without copying this formula over and over again. And the way to do it, we'll go to table settings. Do you see it in blue up here? Are you with me? All right. X is our independent variable. We want to change X, and we want to tell our calculator what X is we're interested in. If we, uh, if we select auto, or if we leave auto selected, our calculator is just going to give us this, which isn't very helpful. So now, our uh, table is in blue up here. I'm pressing second, then graph to go to table. Well, that's interesting. You are correct. You are absolutely correct. Um, 
my goal was to avoid uh, having to type this over and over again, but we're going to have to type it once more. So it's x is the bigger number, so it comes first. We need parentheses around this whole thing. I love technology, but I wish this calculator were a little quicker and more intuitive sometimes. Divided by x minus 1, there. So now when I type in a value here, we're going to get our average velocity on the interval from 1 to this number. So checking our work. When we found the average velocity on the interval from 1 to 2, we got 15.3. And that's precisely what our calculator is telling us, 15.3. And then when we said... Now well, let's make our interval smaller. Let's make our interval end at 1.1. We got 19.71. And that's what our calculator is giving us, 19.71. And now... What was the number I decided? That 1.001, .001, the average velocity on this interval. Is 20.195 meters per second. So again, this is not the velocity we're looking for, but it's presumably pretty close. I mean, we're looking for the exact velocity at one. We found the average velocity instead, but just on this very tiny interval. So the velocity hasn't presumably changed much on this interval. So this is presumably close to what we want, but if we wanted a better approximation still, how could we get it? Keep making this closer to one. 20.2. And the closer we make this to one, the better our approximation becomes. Um, you can't see it when it's just the 20.2. It looks like our approximation isn't changing, but that's just a bit of rounding error. If we highlight it, we see that our approximations are changing the closer we get to one. But, ooh, I wish our calculator wasn't rounding like this. It's going to, it's sort of hiding something important. And that important thing is, okay, the, the closer this is getting to one, the better. So why am I messing around with this table? You know, presumably, if the closer we get to one, the better, then we can just let x be one and get what we're looking for. 
But when we try to do that, when we let x be 1, we get an error. And again, if you're just looking at this table without any context, it looks like something strange is happening because the calculator is doing this rounding. But this is close to 1, but not actually 1, and we get an answer. This is close to 1, but not actually 1, and we get an answer. This is 1, and we get an error. And why are we getting an error? Because you're dividing by 0 is exactly correct. The error is being caused by this denominator. If you let x be 1, then we get the division by 0 error. So here is the situation we are in. We can approximate approximate the velocity at one by looking at the average velocity on an interval. Let's, let's use B instead of X. On the interval from 1 to B. The closer B gets one, the better that approximation becomes, but We can't let B actually equal one. So that's the situation that we're in, and we're going to spend the next few weeks for the nailing down the idea that our input can approach a number, but our input doesn't actually equal the number. And that's what makes this calculus instead of algebra. If we could find the velocity by just letting the input be one, that would be an algebra problem. But there's nothing in algebra like this. There's nothing in algebra where you're looking at values that are closer and closer to the number you care about, but they're not allowed to equal the number you care about. And the concept that we're getting at here is called a limit. Um, limits are actually relatively recent compared to the rest of calculus, although relatively recent still means centuries old. Um, Newton and Leibniz, the co-inventors of calculus, did not use limits. 
once they used kind of vaguely defined numbers that are sometimes like zero and sometimes aren't like zero. And they got the correct answers, but later mathematicians look at their work and they sort of felt like, well, none of this really makes sense. I mean, these, these numbers or you've invented that sometimes act like zero, but sometimes don't act like zero are magic. I mean, there are no rules that govern them. We need to put calculus on a clearer footing than that. So limits come after calculus, but in spite of that, we are going to use limits to develop calculus. And that's happening because of this historical curiosity. So let's say that we have a function f of x and a number b. And we want to know what happens to the function f of x as the input x gets closer and closer to B, but doesn't equal B. So precisely the situation that we described here. Although again, our calculator displaying this and this as one is kind of obscuring that. Um, we let our input get closer and closer to one, but our input isn't allowed to equal one because we get a division by zero error as we equal. One. And as our inputs get closer and closer to one, we look at these outputs, and for a while they're changing pretty significantly. But eventually it looks like these outputs are settling in at about 20.2. Let's check that. How many zeros are here? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros. Come on. There we go. So there's a number 20. Really? I'm not convinced that all of these zeros are not causing rounding error. I was definitely not expecting this to go from 20.2 to 20. I said I love technology, but we're seeing its limitations here. Um, at any rate, we get close, no, this is, this is 100% an error. Well, I say 100%, 99% an error. As these numbers are getting closer and closer 
be nice if deleting this caused it to disappear. As these numbers are getting closer and closer to one, this output is hanging out at around 20.2. So, I mean, I never answered the question, but now I will. As our approximation gets better and better, it's um it's getting closer and closer to 20.2. So it seems likely that the velocity after one second is 20.2. Anyway, back to this. So this is the situation we've described. We call this a limit and we write lim or limit, the function we're interested in, and then below the lim or limit, x, right arrow, whatever number we're approaching. So here we've got, well, it's not f of x we are taking the limit of here. It's this new, new ratio function, but we're taking a limit as x approaches 1, and we're getting 20.2. And that brings us to the end of this section, and also the end of the class period. So I'll let you go, and I'll see you here tomorrow at 9.